Today is just going to be uh, the masterclass on Leona. Um, so we're going to actually just be jumping right into it by um, first presenting or asking kind of like the strengths and weaknesses of Leona. So like when you play this champion, what do you think are the strong points of her? What do you think are the weak points of her? Let's start with um, strengths. So what are like things that make Leona a very powerful champion. Sue has said tons and tons of CC and low cooldowns. That's true. Uh, her Q is the lowest cooldown of all CC champions, for sure. Uh, she is pretty tanky, yes, um, with her W. Makes her really, really durable. One of the strengths of the champion that a lot of people don't even realize is, is that she has a old Doran's-like uh, shield effect. So her W reduces flat damage. So in the early stages, she actually reduces an insane amount of damage in fights. And like basically minions don't do any damage to her because it's a flat rate. Gap closer. Yeah, true. So she comes online pretty early on and you can jump on people. Very good. Skills are easy to hit. That's true too. Zenith Blade is actually a really easy skill shot to hit. Perfect. Just like tying into what we already said, you know, you can engage through minions, minion waves, don't block any of your skills like champions maybe like Nautilus and Thresh run into. So push advantage isn't nearly as important. Much damage. Yeah, she's actually one of the, if not the highest DPS uh, champion for tanks, especially in the early stages, just because of her sunlight procs. All of her spells having pretty good base numbers. And like we already stated before, her stun comes up um very fast five second cooldown and it's an animation cancel too which is a very unique thing about this champion is you can use uh animation canceling on this champion to do a lot of cool stuff which i will be showing you in the tools after we go over some like rudimentary things i'll be showing you all of the cool combos that she can do but anyway because she can animation cancel and auto q auto that actually means that if you actually walk up and you auto someone q and then auto them again you'll do about 150 damage by yourself which is insane for uh, the early game aggression and where a lot of her damage actually comes from. Um, so also tying into that, because we've already established that she has auto attack animation canceling, right? And all the other great things that she has. She clears wards instantly by herself, right? You can take control of brushes and you just auto Q auto once you start practicing that. And you can instantly kill a ward, which means you can get brush control by yourself, which is abnormal for tanks to be able to do which allows you to create a lot more pressure and not get harassed nearly as frequently in nearly any phase. Um, other things that I would say uh, outside of the good suggestions that we've already gotten for Leona is um, a lot of her strength also lies in the fact that she has super good scaling and multiple forms of engage. So you can use Zenith Blade onto someone, cue them, and then ulti, but you also can just lead with your ultimate, which means that your range of engage is really, really high. It makes it a lot easier for you to punish people who are out of position and jump on them quite frequently. Whereas if you play something like maybe Nautilus or Alistar, uh, these champions are a little bit shorter in range, right? Like the ulti for Leona is like 8, 900 versus, you know, the normal combo range of 550 to 600 on the things like Alistar. <laughs> so it's a lot easier for you to just get engages off all the time. Also, um, one thing that's really great is, is once we have good practice on our combos, you lock someone down for a really, really long time, but also you frontline very well. Uh, you know, even if the fight is relatively short, your Q cooldown comes up pretty frequently and it allows you to cycle a lot more stunts in fights. So she's kind of like the ultimate frontliner just because of the fact that her CC is up in such high frequency and she can re-engage over and over again if you're maintaining good positions, which we will be going over when we do our teamfight breakdowns later on. So uh, let's move over to some of her weaknesses. So what are some of the weaknesses of Leona um, at any stage of the game, lane phase, team fights, etc.? What are some problems that she runs into? Good, yes. So CC is cleansable and reduced by tenacity. Yeah, so at higher levels of uh, games, you have to kind of go through cleanse usually when you pick Leona. So she does quite poorly if you're on a team that has a lot of CC because it already actively encourages them to build Merc Treads or even go a going cleanse. An example of this is like Lilia Jungle doesn't really pair that great with Leona because everyone's already encouraged for cleanse. Her level one is not very good. That's true. Her level two starts getting a little bit better, but yeah, she definitely needs a couple of levels to come online. One of the great things that she can do though is clear, clear wards in the brushes and maintain pressure that way, but unless you're hitting level two before someone else, uh, she's kind of weak until we want all three of her skills to be up. 
no disengage. Yeah, she's usually a champion that wants to go in first, <clears throat> although I would disagree a little bit. She does have some level of disengage where you can throw your ultimate from long range and run away, but in general, she doesn't have great to disengage. You need to know when to engage <clears throat> and when not to. Yeah, that's true. Mostly tied to a lot of tanks just in general. Having good reads on when to engage and when you can't can cause a lot of problems where you go in and die. That's very frustrating for a lot of people. Ultimate is easy to dodge unless they're already movement impaired. Yeah, unless people are basically walking in a straight line, the ultimate is a little bit sluggish and has its own animation cancels, so that is something that you can run into. So what I want you guys to think about is what are bat what are some of the worst matchups for Leona and why are they the worst matchups? There we go. E is interruptible. Yeah. So E is a dash, right? So you can actually get it canceled while you're in the air, you know. Examples of this is getting flayed. You can actually get pulverized in the air too. So there are some weaknesses with the champion where uh, you know if there's a lot of ca you know dashing cancels or anything like that, it can be really difficult for this champion to get in on the early stages of the landing phase. Yeah, Janna is a good example too. Morgana can be a rough matchup. Actually, our two lane phase breakdowns are gonna be the her worst matchups, which are Thresh and Morgana. So we'll be going over that. <sighs> Buffer dash on E and gets dragged to turret. Yeah, that's true too. Uh, sometimes if people are stacked on top of each other, your Zenith Blade can, you know, your Zenith Blade reaches to the furthest target. So if you go through multiple players, then you'll actually get dragged further than you actually anticipated to. So those are all definitely problems that you can definitely run into. Lucian E can drag you. Yeah, other dashes can definitely drag you around too. Uh, depending on the timing. So the timing is a little bit fickle in that case. All right. So that pretty much covers like the strengths and weaknesses of Leona. <laughs> so basically right now, um, in the current meta, uh, a lot of tanks are definitely pretty strong right now. So what I would ask you guys is, or when are good times to pick Leona? You know, wh when, when do you feel like in drafts you can just pick Leona, this will be good, this will be fine. When do I want to be picking a champion like Leona? When my team doesn't have a tank, that's good, yeah. I mean, she can be, one of the great things about Leona is she can be a primary engager, right? You can ulti into long range. She can engage by herself. She doesn't really need anyone else's help. Uh, her ulti is actually a pretty short cooldown too, so you can get engages pretty frequently, not nearly as tied to, you know, long cooldowns like maybe a Seraphine. Uh, into mages, uh, yes, she does really well. Some of her best matchups are things like Zyra, Vel'Koz, you know, these kinds of range champions are really squishy and only have damage as their source. Since Leon is so tanky and Aftershock uh, gives you a lot of mobile, you know, wiggle room on engages with your W, you're really durable and it's very easy for you to engage on people. Um, and squishy, immobile, enemy supports, that kind of covers the same thing as mages for sure. I definitely agree with that. Um, Nami, you know, Soraka, Sona are also category, you know, champions that I put into that category. So then she pairs well with champions like Triss, Samira, Kai'Sa. So some of her best laning phase uh, partners are just things that can follow up, right? That's what we're looking for is champions that can just follow up, whether they have a dash or an extra CC or long range stuff. So, you know, some of your best matchups are definitely Triss, like we listed. Uh, Samira can be okay, but not as good as before since her um, since she needs a knockup to activate her passive. Kai'Sa isn't actually a great laning partner for Leona until you hit level 6, which is something you want to try to avoid. Although you can make it work, and a lot of people do pick Kai'Sa, uh, you ideally don't want this as a lane partner. Champions like Jin are actually really good with Leona too, because he, you know, even though he doesn't have a dash like something like Tristana, uh, he can follow up via his W and then use that to close the distance and catch up to people. Um, another example of this is like Lucian. Lucian has a dash and wants to play aggressive and can dive in with you. So anything that has good follow up for you is going to be what you're looking for for your kind of lane partners for it. No, Caitlyn's actually really, really bad with your champion because your stun, as we established beforehand, actually is only a one second stun. So usually Caitlyn needs about 1.5 to 2 seconds, depending on where they're standing, uh, for them to activate, to put their trap down and have it activate. So actually Leona is quite bad with Caitlyn because your stun only lasts one second, and so your traps will never activate unless they just literally stop moving themselves or the trap is put down before you've even engaged. I don't see Jin anymore. Yeah, that's true. Jin's kind of fall into the wayside for sure. 
So yeah, you're usually looking for Leona when you know you're against as we've kind of like wrapping up uh, into mages or squishy champions, and we want something that can follow up. Triss, Samira, Kaisa is okay. Uh, Jin is fine too. These kind of Lucian, these things that can just follow up on you when you're engaging, so they can play aggressive with you and score those kills. We want to make sure that we have a lot of good follow up on them and that your AD carry is moving with you. Um, so let's now talk about uh, rune setups and uh, itemization. So first we'll just tackle rune setups real quick, just to like how to identify what we want to take for runes, why we take them, that so that sort of thing. So we will pop open our runes tab right here. Um, the most common one, obviously, guys, is going to just be running Aftershock. I mean, you pretty much just always run Aftershock as a core function. We're mostly just going to be talking about the, the smaller runes and the secondary and how to identify when we take each of those. So <clears throat> in most cases, uh, you should probably just take Font of Life because this rune scales really, really well. Procs off of all your CC. Um, you know, your E snares, that procs it. Your Q stuns, that procs it. Your ult e slows or, or stuns, that procs it. It's really good because it scales off of your HP, as you can see right here, and it just gives a lot of healing to your teammates. The only time that you pretty much take a different rune is when you take Demolish, and that's if you feel like you're going to get a lot of kills in lane. So an example of this is maybe you're against something like a Zyra or against a Vel'Koz or like a Soraka or something like that. You know, okay, I've got a Lucian, I've got a Trist, etc., and I'm going to probably get kills or have a lot of kill pressure, and so I can actually walk up and take plates whenever they're either dead or reset. <laughs> Is it true that Shield Bass doesn't work on your either W? Correct. It's not actually a shield. <laughs> Despite this champion actually physically having a shield, uh, you don't actually have any shields, so Shield Bash is a dead rune. You don't take it at all on this champion at all, and there's no reason to it, to do it. Demolish will probably produce inconsistent results, though, just depending on how your laning phase goes. That's why I'm not as big a fan of it, even though it does feel really great to tear down turrets when you do force people out of lane or kill them. This champion is not a great sieger, and a lot of times if you walk all the way up to the turret... You'll leave yourself exposed to getting harassed a lot, so I'm not as big of a fan of it, and usually just take Font of Life. After that is this page right here. <clears throat> this is based on matchup and comfort level all combined. For me personally, I always take conditioning just because I prefer to have the bonus armor and MR when it comes to the mid game because fighting over the third and fourth dragon is pretty much the premium on all game states. But if you feel like you need some extra help in laning phase, here's how to identify when you use the other two runes. Number one, second wind. We take this basically whenever we're against poke champions that have a lot of harass. So if you were playing against, uh, you know, a Zyra, a Vel'Koz, a Senna, these kinds of things that are going to poke you a lot, the second wind is great for this just to kind of help you sustain a little bit through the lading phase. Then you take bone plating if you're against an all-in champion. So maybe you're against an Alistar, a Rel, a Nautilus, etc. This is where bone plating really comes in handy because it allows you to mitigate damage on your all-ins. One thing to note though is if you do take bone plating is it's very easy for it to get hit off and also another thing to note too is if you read right here after taking damage from an enemy champion the next three spells that you receive from them is reduced. So that means that whoever hits you is the one you also mitigate. So that means that if you ever get poked or hit by the AD carry and you know then you all in on the tank and the tank starts hitting you it's only going to mitigate towards the AD carry in that time slot rather than the support. So you have to play around it a little bit more and it's more finicky and you need to make sure it doesn't get poked off. Otherwise you gain no value from it, which is another reason why I don't like it as much and I run conditioning way more frequently. After that is this page right here. In most cases, you should pretty much always take overgrowth. The reason behind this is just basically because of the fact that although unflinching is not terrible, <clears throat> this only starts at 10% and can go up to 20% um, based on missing health. But the thing is, is... Usually if you get CC'd at incredibly low health, you usually die at that stage of the game. Plus there's other options for tenacity that are much better and more efficient, so I don't like it that much. On average, Overgrowth will give you about 150 to 200 extra HP in a game, and that's actually a lot. That's literally worth 400 extra gold, and especially on a low economy like supports, it's usually better to take this in most cases. After that is the secondary rune page, which is basically what adjusts the most depending on what you need for your team composition or maybe your laning matchups. 
So as I said before, if there is a lot of crowd control, you know, there's a Caitlyn Morgana. We're against, you know, four CC champions. Whatever uh, problems that you end up running into, you can just take Legends Tenacity. It's a better solution in most cases for your secondary runes, and it means that you're not going to give up any extra HP. Hello, Allie. And then your secondary page is just going to be based on whatever else you need. So a lot of times I tend to take Triumph nowadays just because of the fact that I like the extra HP for when I go in and then I'm kind of backwards because it procs off of your assist really well, helps your economy a little bit in terms of making you additional gold. And in general, uh, Presence of Mind is not really that great of a rune anymore since it doesn't give the base mana. If you do feel like you're running out of mana a lot though, you can opt into doing a rune page like this and it's not terrible either. The most important thing though is you're just really taking this rune page in case there's a lot of crowd control. Caitlyn Morgana is an example I use, but maybe there's a lot more other champions. There's Lilia, you know, there's uh, <coughs> there's a Vigar. You're running into just a lot of crowd control in general and you need to get out of it. This is a great rune page just to take for team fighting. If you want to focus a little bit more on laning phase, then there is the uh, inspiration tree. Most of the time, whenever I play against champions that are longer range than me, I take this page right here, which is Hextech, Flash, and Biscuits. It means that you don't have to feel nearly as bad about trading your flashes out with something that's squishy like a Zyra, a Vel'Koz, etc. Because of the fact that you will then have Hextech Flash to be able to channel Hextech Flash and jump on people. I usually recommend that you get an early sweeper when you run this page too, just because of the fact that it allows you to control brushes. Also, the Biscuits are really great too, because it solves a lot of your... HP in the early stages and it raises your mana cap which is really really helpful because a lot of times in the early stages when you have longer fights you cycle through more than one spell cycle uh, getting the extra mana is super super helpful for you just to maintain you know being able to cycle more spells 150 mana surprisingly enough makes a huge difference that's why I also like items like Zeke's Herald on this champion just because of the fact that it solves a lot of mana problems for it after that, you should pretty much always run Ability Haste. The reason behind this is just because of uh, math. The value that you get on Ability Haste comparatively to these two stats right here are significantly higher. So unless you're basically playing to try to all in and one shot somebody, you should always take Ability Haste since it scales the best and it functions the best for your character. After that, I usually take at least one armor rune and then my decision is another armor rune or magic resist depending on the support and the jungle matchup. So if I'm playing against something that does magic damage just in my lane, I'll then opt into a magic resist rune. If for whatever reason there isn't a lot of magic damage, or maybe I'm just playing against a tank that I'm not too worried about in terms of damage, and there's a physical damage jungler, then I'll take the extra armor. This is just mostly predicated on whatever damage archetypes you're playing against. So when it comes to build paths afterwards, there's basically kind of two different options, which is going to be lock it, or um, <laughs> Locket or Chem Tank. Uh, Chem Tank is actually receiving some nerfs, but it's still not a bad item to build in some circumstances, depending on uh, your team compositions. Remember what we talked about before when we wanted to pick, <laughs> we wanted to pick this champion because oh, we don't have any frontliner. Oh, we don't have any engage. Well, basically, you build Chem Tank whenever your team has no engage whatsoever, and you have to be the primary engager. Maybe you're the only person that can start fights at all. So this is a great item to still build uh, whenever you get into circumstances like that, just so that you can always guarantee and engage on an important person. Also, this is a great item to build, by the way, if there are very little damage threats on the enemy team. So as you've probably seen in some of your pro play, uh, there's a lot of tanks going around right now. The tank support, tank jungle, tank top laner, and there's only really two damage sources. If you run into games like this, this is also a really good time to build chem tank because usually you just have to barrel down, you know, either the mid laner or AD carry. And if you lock them down and guarantee their deaths in a fight, it usually becomes very easy for your team to fight just because the enemy team has low damage. So this is kind of the decision making that I go when it comes to itemization. If for whatever reason the enemy team has engage or you know you have plenty of other engage or you feel like you can just find engage without the extra helm, Locket is actually the better tanky item because of the fact that it's a lot less expensive. Plus on top of that, the extra shielding that you get has to be valued into the item itself. So you see how it gives you 200 health, but then even at level one, it gives you 230 shielding, which means that if you're just shielding at the right times, this item gives you almost 450 health just base before we even talk about things like the allied aura or the scaling level of the shield. So this item is just in general, the best item to build in most cases. So if the enemy team has engaged where, you know, you're going to have to front line for it, maybe they have a Nautilus, maybe they have a bully bear, you know, they have a Hecarim, et cetera, where, you know, you're going to front line, 
this item is just better in most cases. So I would probably say that about 70, 30 is kind of the split that I have for my itemization. I usually get lock at about 70% of the time and then maybe 30 ish percent of the time I'll go chem tank. Uh, on Leona. If you basically build lock it almost every time though, you'll usually find yourself not running into too many problems, especially since uh, chem tank is actually getting nerfed in the next patch to just a note. That pretty much breaks down all of our itemization and runes and such like that. So what I want you to, sh uh, what I want to show you guys now is uh, Leona's combos, <laughs> um, which are really important to actually learn and master. So, um, you know, after, after this lesson, if you do feel like you want to play Leona at all, these are things to practice and you can practice them in, to, uh, you know, in the tool all you want. So it's actually very easy for you to refine and get used to doing all of these combos because it will allow you to do a lot of different mix ups mix ups and make a lot more decisions based on your cooldowns. Okay. So let's first talk, talk about the, uh, basics of Leona. So as we talked before, um, at the start of the, at the start of the conversation was her CC actually lands pretty late or uh it's pretty it's pretty low on its duration so it's one second cooldown so as we talked before right the ultimate has its own animation where your character must lift up its you know lift it up the spell actually has to fully cast and go off so the most important and fundamental combo that you will ever need to know on this champion is how to just lock someone down so that they can't dodge cc so if you're ever CCing someone, a lot of times they'll actually have a tendency to be spamming either their dash or flash. We want to make sure that they can never do that as much as possible. So whenever you Zenith Blade and Stun, you need to already be casting your ultimate. Otherwise, people with either tenacity or they're spamming their flash can get out of it. So the core base fundamental cooldown is going to be obviously we're Zenith Blade stunning and we're ulting at the same time. Basically what's happening is, is your character is pressing Q but he's also casting the uh, the ulti at the same time. This will cause it to overlap and land at the same time so that no one spamming out of, you know, out of CC, whether it's a dash, a flash, etc., can get out of it. It's very important that you actually practice this and make sure that you're doing it cleanly because if you're too slow on it, then anyone who's spamming any dashes or flashes will get out of your stun. So what I want you to pay attention to is just the difference in speed, right? So we Q and then we ulti. But then if you're doing something like you're Zenith blading in, you're stunning, you're hitting them, and then you ulti like that, you can kind of see that there is extra time for people to dash out of it. It's very important that we learn that and we make sure that we're learning how to do that consistently. I call it pre-casting where basically I've already casted my stun and I'm just waiting for the, the ulti to go off afterwards. If you do all of that together and wait for the stun to go off and just immediately ulti, you'll CC everyone every time and they won't be able to get out and you'll always guarantee the kill, especially even if they're spamming their sums out of it. Next is, is a different technique. So maybe in some circumstances you're running around, you're hitting people with your stun, right? You're putting your stun on cooldown. Maybe you're just frontlining, stunning someone, but you don't want to fully Zenith blade in, but then you see an opportunity to go for someone. The next thing that you can actually do is you can Zenith blade and ulti together. So as you can see right here, you can actually clip the animations for all of your abilities. So as you can see right here, I'm Zenith blading, but I'm actually ulting while my Zenith blade is going through the air. Because of this, it's activating my snare, which is 0.5 seconds, but I'm actually clipping it by using my ultimate in the air. So they're snared and then my ultimate goes off and CCs them. It's another great way to lock people down if you know that they're not going to be able to dash or if you just don't have your cool cooldown up. Maybe a stupid question, uh, but combo is E, Q, right click, R, or the other order? <laughs> oh, so for the old combo, it's just I've already clicked on them and then I'm ulting. So it's E... I've pre-casted my Q, Q hits, but because I'm right-clicking on them, and then you ulti. So yeah, the, the second combo is the Zenith Blade and Ultimate in the air. Because your root lasts 0.5 seconds, and the way the animation cancel or you know casting for your ultimate happens, as you can see right here, we're clipping it. So like they're snared right now, and because the snare is 0.5 seconds, the snare ends and your ulti hits. So it's actually a great way to actually CC somebody if you know that they're either A, not going to spam a dash, or if your just Q is on cooldown for whatever reason. It's a great way to kind of add mix-ups to a lot of your abilities and uh, CC, CC, CC somebody for a longer period of time. In an ideal world, actually, if the enemy player doesn't have a dash or a flash or something like that, this is actually a better combo because you're clipping the animation in the air and then you can stun afterwards. 
but it's a lot harder to pull off and more inconsistent and has more variables. So it's something you should only really do if you know that the player doesn't have dashes, flashes, or if your Q is just on cooldown and you want to just chain CC people. Um, then obviously one of the things that you can do for this champion in general, remember what we talked about before where clearing wards is really important, is just practicing your auto Q auto, right? So this is three autos together. It gives you the most amount of damage. So if you're playing against somebody and you just want to front load as much damage, maybe you're just hitting a t another tank or they're not running away, this is the best way to do it, as you can kind of see right there. We're doing plenty of damage. This is the maximum amount of damage, but it's also, you know, you're giving someone the ability to jump away. So you need to kind of mix that up just depending on whether or not you're worried about them flashing or dashing away. A lot of this champion is just keeping track of whether or not your opponent can flash and dash away and then using the most maximum amount of stuff that you can possibly get. So let's get to the most expert level stuff, which is going to be the hardest to pull off consistently. But once you actually practice it and can master it, it is going to be something that will help you a lot in climbing in high elo <coughs> or low elo, either one. Um, it's going to be the E-Flash, yes. So if you didn't know this, uh, you can actually E-Flash. So a lot of people who play this game, if they're looking for an engage, they'll flash and then E, right, to Zenith Blade. Um, so next, what I'm going to be introducing you to, though, is E-Flash, which is, as you saw uh, on the screen before we uh, dropped out of the game, is that you know when you flash and you Zenith Blade, there's, like an a there's a full animation, right? You're giving someone the time to react. And we want to make sure that our opponents can't react at all. So one thing that you can do in the game is you can actually E and then flash on your champion. <laughs> um, but it's very hard and you have to get the timing really well done right. So what I'm going to do is teach you how to identify that timing and how to consistently replicate it uh, on a pretty consistent basis. Uh, it's, it's definitely hard to do 100% of the time. So that is one thing to note. Um, but practice makes perfect, and that's what we're looking for uh, in all of these circumstances. What's your opinion on Cheap Shot and Relentless Hunter as secondary runes? Terrible. Damage mount uh, is basically non-existent, and at that point in time, you're operating with some pretty dead runes most of the time. You don't really need the extra movement speed at all uh, on your champion. If you need it, you can just go mobility boots, and both inspiration and precision outpace them significantly more. So... We're going to be talking about uh, Zenith Blade Flash. So as you can see right here, I'll just do each of them one at a time, right? So which is going to be Flash, Zenith Blade. So you see how like we flash, your character has to stop, and then full cast the Zenith Blade. What you're going to be doing on Zenith Blade Flash is you're going to be canceling the whole animation. So as you can see right here, see how your character lifts up the weapon and then you flash immediately so it's basically you're going to instantly flash after you've hit zenith blade the timing is relatively punishable though so like if you do it too late right can't flash right there you do it like that if your character is fully in the animation she cannot do it so what you have to do is just tap e and then flash immediately if you do this you can guarantee engage every time though because there's no way to there's very little ways to react to it as you can see right here flash and then zenith blade that gives you almost a half a second to react whereas if you zenith blade flash we're going through the full animation already before we've even fully flashed and this will allow you to get really good engages off so for example then you stun right here you can use all of that in tandem with each other so that's what we're mostly looking for this is the highest level and most difficult thing in the game most pro players don't even do it so don't feel bad if you can't do it at the start, but it is something that you should practice maybe even lightly and not super hard uh, because if for whatever reason you're really inactive in the laning phase, maybe you just couldn't get any engages off. <clears throat> when you hit level six, you can pretty much guarantee a 2v2 kill every time. This is actually how I climbed one of my accounts to masters with literally like a 90% win rate on Leona was sometimes there was just no activity in my laning phase at all. And we actually just Zenith Blade flashed and then stunned and then ultied and killed them every time. And that pretty much concludes all of our comboing videos for uh, Leona in that sense. Can you flash slightly in another direction than you E? Yeah, you can, you can do it whatever way you want. I usually recommend just doing it in a straight line because it's the hard, it, you add way more layers of complications to your character if you're trying to Zenith Blade into a different direction. But yes, if you are 
Uh, if you want to, you can definitely redirect it a little bit based on your mouth. Uh, not mouth, mouse. If it doesn't work, it looks hella stupid. Well, most of the time, if you mistime it, your character just won't flash. If you're actually pressing E and then using your Zenith Blade after, or using your flash afterwards, you just won't flash. So it's not like the end of the world. You'll just kind of Zenith Blade in place. Okay, so let's talk about the bad matchups, right? So we're going to be doing a lane phase breakdown on how to play against Thresh, one of her worst matchups, and then we'll be going over a Morgana matchup too. We will be actually talking about how to deal with Thresh matchups. As we stated before, right, uh, Thresh can cancel your Zenith Blade, which makes it actually incredibly hard for you to create pressure in this lane, just because of the fact that you can always easily be canceled in the middle of the air. So what I'm going to be showing you today is a lane phase breakdown where, you know, we circumvent that. We break it. We figure out timings and ways to abuse the fact that Flay occurs. So obviously, in pretty much all Thresh matchups, at early stages, you're just trying to make sure you're not getting poked as much, getting as much EXP as possible, and not getting zoned away from the minions. Because Thresh outranges you and forces the wave into your turret, as you can kind of see right here. But... One of the benefits of the fact that he pushes it into the turret is that means that you are playing under your turret and you can look for potential engages when that occurs. So as you can kind of see right here, and as we've established previously beforehand, Leona kind of wants level three before she really comes online because then she's actually really, really tanky outside of even the aftershock. Once we have our W, you have three forms of sunlight proc, so it gives you a lot of extra damage and it means that you will be a lot more durable when it comes to, you know, 2v2 fighting. So as you can kind of see right here, we're just making sure we're farming under the turret and kind of chilling. And, you know, because by proxy of the, you know, the game state itself, wave pushes into us every time. If you didn't remember, uh, you, you level up to level three after the, or the three melees, as you can see right here, after the cannon wave. So what I want you guys to mostly uh, understand when it comes to this matchup is the fact that and even though he can stop your dash, the benefit of this matchup is the fact that one, Flay does damage to you, and two, Flash can break all of this. So whenever you're actually looking for a way to kill people, you need to make sure that you're comboing your Flash with it. So because of the fact that Thresh can, you know, stop your Zenith Blade doesn't mean that your Q is canceled. So as you can see right here, we're going to hit level three immediately. And as I told you beforehand, right, Flay does damage. And since he's under the turret, even if he flays, even if he flays me, he's going to take turret aggro because of it. This is an easy way for you to kind of punish Threshes that are playing overly aggressive on you. And honestly, a really important principle to apply, which is just comboing your flash onto Thresh whenever he stops your engage immediately. So as you can see right here, we're going to Zenith Blade on, and now he's tanking the turret. And just because he cancels your Zenith Blade doesn't mean you can't go in. So if you have good engages that you're already seeing, just combo with your Flash immediately. Eat the Flay, it doesn't matter, and then just Flash and Q them. So as you can see right here, dump the Ignite immediately. And after that, it's just really easy for you to just continuously pile forward. <coughs> gaining us the kills in the lane. After that, we're going to take a reset and just come back to lane afterwards and clear out the wave. So the next part of the matchup is uh, a really important thing. So Thresh, whenever he's playing matchups, he needs to play man-to-man -man defense. And what I mean by that is Flay is a lot harder to hit when you're shooting it to the side and trying to hit someone in a side, whereas opposed to going, you know, forward to forward is a lot easier. So if I Zenith Blade on him right here, it's very easy for him to flay me. But if I Zenith Blade onto someone else that he's not in front of, then it becomes significantly harder for him to flay. So as you can kind of see right here, the Draven isn't sitting on top of the AD carry. And now I have an exposed angle for it. So we kill this minion and look at how much harder it is for the Thresh to actually flay me. It's really, really hard for him, and in all honesty, almost impossible in most cases, unless he's literally one of the best Threshes ever, or just very lucky. So any time that, even if you're playing against someone like Thresh, if they split up and the, and the Thresh isn't facing towards you, go on the AD carry. It's very easy for you to jump on him and CC him and score kills, because the Flay is very unlikely for, you, for it to hit you. And then as we see right here, right, we uh, we have short cooldowns, so we're just utilizing them, just stunning whoever we can. And then once of all of our cooldowns are back up, bada boom, bada bing, 
We turret dive and just trade kills because he loses his stacks before he kills me. And we score two more kills in the laning phase. This is how you play all Thresh matchups though. Is regardless of whatever AD carry matchup it is, it's just about paying attention to how Flay is and where angles are. So two things that I want you to take away from this is if it's a good engage and you get flayed, just flash on the player. Flash on him, ignite him, barrel down on him. You can guarantee all ins way easier than you think. And a lot of times people play matchups way too aggressively because they think flay makes them invincible, but it doesn't because you can just combo your flash and score kills that way. And then the other thing that I want you to take away with is try to try to unmatch with the with the thresh wherever the thresh is standing try to switch sides with him over and over again so you're facing towards the ad carry that way it's way harder for him to flay you and it makes it so you can look for a lot of good engages even if he lanterns out you usually take about half their life anyway and it's really easy for you to win win laning phases after that does anyone have any questions about these this kind of matchup before we move on to the morgana one <clears throat> generally into tank matchups typically it is the first one to go in that loses right no it's the first one to get locked out of aftershock that loses <clears throat> so for example uh when leona if leona engages on a nautilus and you stun him and he doesn't get aftershock proc you kill the nautilus because by the time he gets the aftershock proc off you've usually dumped all your damage and he's taken so much damage that he loses and one of the benefits and one of the reasons why Leona does really well into other tanks is because of the fact that your stun is a way shorter cooldown than their hook or their, you know, pulverize or their, you know, W on rel, etc. So actually, that's why Leona is a tank beater too, just because of the fact that her Q cooldown is so short that it's just super powerful. Plus, if you're really if you're really playing matchups correctly, the way you usually do most matchups on Leona against other tanks is you don't use your W, you Zenith Blade in and you stun them. And then you wait for Aftershock to be down, and then you use W after that. So you get even longer of a tank boost on your character. Uh, when is it good to start with Flash Q? If they're already trading on your ADC, it's really, really good. First off, what we're going to do is I'm going to show you some no-nos. Uh, I'm going to show you uh, how to make, you know, what mistakes, and we'll talk about what mistakes I do in this matchup. And then we'll show you how to kind of avoid that, and then how to turn around even a lane phase against Morgana that actually goes bad in the early stages. So as we've already stated beforehand, Leona's pretty bad at level one, right? We want to make sure that we're soaking as much EXP as possible and pulling the wave as much as possible. So anytime that the binding is down, as you can kind of see right here, I'm walking forward just to make sure that I'm soaking EXP for the minions that are dying. <clears throat> but as the wave pushes into you, we want to just make sure that you're not losing a lot of HP. Sometimes in some bad matchups, especially like Caitlyn Morgana, for example, it's a pretty doomsday matchup you're just going to lose some EXP and gold. That's just kind of how it is. But the most important thing is to try to make sure you're just healthy. That way you can still soak EXP and look for all engages uh, once that once like the lane starts pushing towards you. So now that we've hit level 2, we're able to you know just walk up since our jungler is down here and make sure that we get all that juicy EXP and gold, especially the cannon that we're looking for. Now, since my jungler is down here, I go in and actually just kill myself. So, things that we want to make sure that we watch out for and what we're going to be talking about in terms of mistakes that are commonly made in this matchup. Number one is, <coughs> is binding. So, as we move forward through this laning phase and we talk about you know what I didn't do correctly and what, what I should do, what I'm going to show you is, yes, exactly. I'm going to show you how to now actually play aggressively and not kill yourself when it comes to setting up plays. So number one, what I should have done is I should have just done, uh, if I was going to engage like that, I should have just flashed forward to dodge the binding. If you're going to do an engage like that in the early stages and you don't have your W, you're pretty squishy and it's very easy for you to kill. A lot of this matchup isn't actually playing around the black shield as Leona. It's actually playing around the, um, it's actually playing around the, uh, the binding. The binding is really what kills you. The black shield actually doesn't do anything in this matchup. This is where the common misconception of the matchup actually is broken down. So what I want you to pay attention to for the rest of the lane phase is how do we get pressure in this lane without killing ourselves? So we killed ourselves. We set up a, an okay-ish gank, but the main thing that I didn't do was pay attention to binding. So that's what we're going to kind of watch and pay attention to when it comes to this lane phase now that we've kind of gotten past over the hump. Now, another thing to note too is your spells do magic damage. So when you do engage, you don't have to actually commit your Q. You can just let your W explode 
and break the shield and then look for engage. That's pretty much what you're looking for every time. So what I want you to pay attention to is why did this engage go well versus the last engage going poorly? It's all about playing around bindings. <clears throat> so as you can see right here, the Morgana is going to walk up and throw her binding. That gives us about 10 seconds to kind of do whatever we want. So after my AD carry has cleared most of the CS, we go on her. Because there's no binding to combo on you and threaten you, you're actually really tanky and you can wait out the black shield. What I do here is what I call leading. Whenever you engage on someone, you kind of want to lead and walk past them so that you're on top of them the whole time so that your Q comes off cooldown so you can kill them again. So as you see right here, we activate our E and our W is on, but I haven't used my stun at all. We wait for the black shield to basically explode and then we stun her afterwards. And one of the things that's really important whenever you're fighting people is you're chasing in front of them. So you see how like I'm always moving in front of this player the whole time. That way I can just be stacked on them the whole time and then my stun comes back up and it's an easy secure after my Zenith Blade comes out and kills them. A lot of this matchup is not the Black Shield, it's the Binding. Because if the Binding is on cooldown, then you won't take any, you won't receive any damage and you can long fight the fight. Because you're just tankier than them and once Morgana has no stun or a snare on you, it's just very easy for you to operate the laning phase that way. So, that is what I want you to kind of take away when it comes to this matchup is don't play around Black Shield, play around the Binding. The Binding is really the most important part of it. So anytime that the Binding on Morgana is down, these are easy times for you to just jump in because of the fact that there's just no repercussions. They're not going to be able to do enough damage and you will eventually break that Black Shield with your W and your Zenith Blade. So it's not a big deal whatsoever. Then after this, we just kind of execute a dive that's pretty easy for us just because of the fact that, you know, our teammate put GP ult on that, and I'm okay trading my life just because of the fact that he's going to miss the whole wave under the turret, and I would rather do that than not allow them to, you know, potentially turn a fight. Does anyone have any questions about Morgana, the Morgana matchup before we go over lightly a couple of team fights and then kind of close out for today? What happens at 6? So 6 becomes a little bit more complicated uh, just because you can do a lot of things at level 6 that allow you to you know, create pressure and score kills, etc. So once you hit 6, let's see if we have 6 in this game. Uh, once you hit level 6, then you can just kind of go on whoever and then ulti the other person. So still the same concept, play around the binding, etc. But the concept changes where basically... Uh, what you want to do is you want to ulti whoever isn't black shielded. So like, for example, like if I, you know, if I Zenith blade onto the Morgana and the Morgana black shields herself, right? But the Caitlyn is nearby, then I throw the ulti on the Caitlyn and then I walk over and I Q her. But most of what you need to take away for for this laning phase is really just to play around bindings. Anytime there's a binding down, you should always be playing aggressively and trying to score kills on them just because they don't have any way to return any damage to you. So the matchup becomes very easy at that point in time. I don't think in this game there's going to be any examples of that because laning phase ends too early. Most important thing, though, that I want to just have you take away from is a lot of people, when they view this matchup, they view it as... Oh, I need to, you know, bait out the black shield and like re-engage, etc. But actually what you want to do is you want to bait out the binding because then there's no way to, you know, there's no repercussions for them going on you. And it makes it significantly easier for you to chase someone down the, the lane because then you can eventually turn through the black shield in that case. Can you tell us how to, um, how to play effectively versus Leona or is it too wide of a topic? Um... <sighs> The main thing is uh, pay attention to where the ADC is. Wherever the enemy ADC is, if the Leona goes in and the ADC can't follow up, then you should always play aggressive on the Leona. It's mostly, whenever you play tank matchups, whenever you play like League of Legends in general, a good principle to have for laning phase is to always be shoulder to shoulder with your teammate. <coughs> So if the Leona is really far away from their AD carry, just making sure that you're constantly harassing her and hammering her and then punishing her if she does go in because the AD carry can't follow up 
is basically how you're going to get a lot of momentum on Leona. Kind of, you know, kind of just punishing overreaches or just like mispositions in that sense. So uh, let's talk about uh, some team fights, right? So when it comes to team fighting, there's a lot of complicated things that go into team fighting. So one of the biggest mistakes that a lot of people make when they play champions like Leona, Alistar, etc., is they think that because they're tanking damage, they're doing the fight correctly. But that's actually not correct in a lot of cases. What you usually want to be doing is, is kind of going in and out of fights. So as you see right here, this is going to be just a pre presentation of 4v, a 4v4. So as you can see right here, my teammates are walking over and they're collapsing on this side. So I'm making sure that I'm kind of just sitting on my cooldowns unless the enemy player uses any of their cooldowns. So as you see right here, he dashes as I, as I Zenith Blade and I forced him out of the fight. Because of that, I'm now just going to reinforce my teammate right here and just burn whatever's in front of me. So as you can see, we use our lock-in immediately. I'm not actually going too hard on anybody, and we're just walking in and out over and over again. Not always tanking is actually a really important thing that you'll see as kind of like a premise for a lot of the team fight breakdowns that we do, where you're kind of going in and out. You know, you're engaging, you're CCing somebody, and then you're pulling back. You're engaging, you're CCing, and you're pulling back. Unless the fight is super overwhelmingly good or you've connected onto a important target so now that we've got our isolated part we're just using our cooldowns whenever we can now an important thing to note and a lot of the common mistakes that a lot of people make is is you don't need to use your ultimate to start a fight if your teammates are cc'ing or if you, those aren't important targets so what i would point to you is is a lot of people approaching this fight would immediately use their ultimate but it's actually not correct at all there's no way for these enemy players to get away we've already pushed out the shen out of the fight and so that is why I'm just walking over normally and just using my locket immediately to gain value. Now that we see the Shen ultimate, I'm just going to go on Hecarim to isolate targets again. Sometimes what you want to do as a tank is just split up the fight. Put pressure on people that are trying to deal damage so that you can absorb the damage and split up how much is incoming on their team. So as you see right here, I have now put pressure on the Hecarim and the Hecarim has to pull out because of it. And then he doesn't deliver the Shen ultimate. Then, because we're now approaching the fight and winning the fight, I throw my ultimate at the AD carry, not at the Shen. We're not trying to isolate and kill people. We're kind of creating multiple lanes of pressure on whoever is going on. Since my teammates are already hitting this guy, I don't need to be delivering that also. I need to be creating pressure on things that are going to deal a lot of damage and harass my teammates as they push forward. So because of that, we've forced immediate cooldowns, right? And a good knockup be because of the fact that we've gotten the flash. And we just pile on this player and we're able to burn him down. After that, it's just kind of a guaranteed dive afterwards since I can take the turret. And we score an easy an easy one for a four in this team fight just because of the fact that we're not overusing our cooldowns, making sure we're kiting in and out, and kind of getting all of that done in terms of team fights. <clears throat> one thing that I want people to understand though is breaking up fights is one of the most important skills when it comes to uh, tanks, engage, CC, anything. It's a really helpful principle when it comes to fights, and it's why it's so important for you to understand how to do it. So not every game do you get an engage at the start of the fight on someone else. So what I want you guys to learn is also how to counter engage, how to engage at good spots where people are trying to follow up, etc. I'm sure that you've played games where you've gotten a good engage, you've locked a lot of people down, then your teammates move forward to reinforce it, and it kind of gets them killed because of this. I'm going to teach you how to identify how to do that itself. <clears throat> so as you can kind of see right here, we're just posturing around the dragon. You know, I'm sure everyone's had these kinds of scenarios. Everyone's starting to walk around. We're clearing out some of the wards and a bar ultimate hits. So because the bar ultimate hits, it corrals all these players through the corridor to follow up. Because of that, I'm just going to go on the th champions that are going to do a lot of damage. Now, remember what we talked about originally, which is that... Uh, Zenith Blade unfortunately drags you through everybody. So as you can see right here, it actually takes me to the wrong target. I want to get on the Talia. So you can actually sometimes just use your flash to reposition yourself and CC whoever you can. So as you see right here, I flash onto them and I CC all four of those players. Afterwards, what you can see me doing is I'm actually kiting out and just waiting for my cooldowns again. It's an important principle just in general for whenever you do play tanks is to make sure that once you start absorbing damage that you aren't just sitting there getting hit the whole time. 
So as you can see right here, we're CCing all of this follow-up so that no one can actually collapse on this scenario. And we're just CCing and scooting back the whole time and waiting for my spells to come back up. This will allow you to get multiple engages and lockdowns off and bring way more value to your character when it comes to 5v5ing. So just because of the fact that you've dumped all your spells and you know now you're soaking some damage doesn't mean you can just walk in aimlessly and just get hit over and over again. You should kite in, kite out, want to go in and out over and over again just to get as many spell cycles as possible. This is, this is how the premium tank players play the game. So now I'm sure a lot of people always have the questions of is when is it good to to engage versus peeling <clears throat> so here's a great example of a time where peeling is actually much better than engaging so as the fight occurs right we've already scored a kill and enemy players are coming into the fight as you can see where my position is i can't realistically reach anyone else and my teammates are actually coming in from different sides so this is a really great example of when to peel so because of the fact that even if I go on any of these players right here, my teammates can't follow up and there won't be a lot of damage, it's much better for me to just absorb as much damage as possible and peel for my teammate. So this is how I make the decision on whether or not I peel or I just dive in is based on numbers advantage, where people can follow up, and also just what targets I'm keeping alive. Sometimes in some games, as you can kind of see from the tab market, uh, if you have someone who has a lot of kills, a lot of times it's just better to stand in front of them and peel for them. Or you can engage and then pull back and peel for them in that way too. These are all functional ways to kind of win team fights, and a lot of it is adaptable just based on whether or not you know your carries are doing well or if their carries are doing well. Sometimes in some games, if the enemy ADC has, you know, 12, 15, you know, or their mid laner has 10 kills or something like that, I have to kill him in every fight. There are times where I will literally run through the enemy team and flash onto their mid laner and just pile onto him. A lot of times the decision making is just predicated on numbers. Who is strong? Who is not strong? And can I reach them? And will I get follow up? Those are all things that I kind of put into perspective when it comes to team fighting and what I decide on. Uh, when it comes to peeling or going in. <clears throat> so, one thing that I want to show you also is is kind of the kite in and kite out strategy that you can apply when it comes to team fighting on this champion since you can engage and re-engage a lot since you have a dash on your character. So, not all team fights are created equal and sometimes <clears throat> and sometimes your teammates are dead at the start of the fight. So, how do you team fight where your numbers disadvantage? Well, a lot of it is kiting in and out. So as you can kind of see right here, my AD carry or one of my AD carries gets jumped on and immediately gets forced out of the fight. <clears throat> so because of that, we're just kiting backwards and looking for positional errors. What if the NA player on the teaming team is strong and all my teammates are weak? Uh, do I peel or do I engage? It's dependent on positioning. So remember the last team fight we showed you where um, remember the last team fight I showed you where <clears throat> they get in a good engage off. Sometimes you just let them engage and you counter engage based on wherever they're positioned. That is usually a lot of times what you want to do. This is also why I recommend lock it more often than not, just because if you do start falling behind a little bit, <clears throat> what you can do with lock it is, is you can shock engage where like if they engage on you, you can be standing in the middle of it and just CC whoever's in front of you and then kite backwards and then re-engage over and over again. This fight is actually a really great example of, of learning how to actually kite very well. So as you can kind of see right here, the fight happens. I miss my Zenith Blade. They're starting to push forward. And kind of what I'm doing is, is I'm just moving back and forth over and over again to just make sure I don't get hit by skill shots. So he gets you know hit by all the skill shots, but I'm just kind of waiting my time. Because when you CC where someone can follow up on it, you can kill someone almost instantly. So as you can see right here, he takes all of that damage. But now they're all pushing into him. A trap hits and boom, we can engage and guarantee an instant kill. Even though we're actually fighting this fight, by the way, uh, four versus three. Even though we're four versus three, sometimes just kiting and hammering someone who's mispositioned is really a great way to actually frontline and CC for your, for your team. And then after that, <clears throat> because of the fact that we have Shen ultimate, I just continue forward. Walking up, I get pulled in. We get the Shen ultimate right here. I know the Shen ultimate's going to deliver, so we just go in and you know, deliver the shine and that guarantees us three more kills. A lot of times when it comes to team fight on champions like Leona and just tanks in general is just the the in and then the out. That's what I want you to pull away from from like a lot of these team fight breakdowns is 
you know, even though maybe you're coming from an awkward angle or whatever, we want to make sure that we're utilizing our health bar in a way that actually matters. So as this fight happens, right, we're walking into the fight, we Zenith Blade in, we're just CCing whoever we can. <clears throat> and then once our CC is down, right, you see how we're kiting backwards, our spells are back up, boom, we go back in again, right? You're kind of going in and out, in and out. Stop playing Leona like sex, okay. And we're just making sure that we're utilizing all of our stuff. Walking up and just face tanking people is not tanking, is basically what I want you to take away from a lot of these team fights. Tanking is engaging, locking people down, absorbing some damage, you know, stepping back, waiting for your cooldowns to be back up, and then doing it over and over again. And that's how you get the maximum amount of value out of a champion like Leona in team fights. It's not just ulting, going in, and dying. Sometimes it is if the enemy team has like a really important person that you need to kill, but a lot of times good team fights will look like this where you're just, you know, you're jumping in, you're jumping out, you're CCing people, and you're just kind of doing whatever you can for the fights. Here's like another great team fight for this kind of example where, you know, we get the TP coming in, the Volley Bear comes in, they engage, right? So we're CCing people and we're just pulling back the whole time because no one can follow up. And we're just holding this choke right here. We hit the Galio with our CC, we're taking some damage, we CC a little bit, we go back in. You're kind of going in and out over and over again, making sure that you still absorb damage, but you're kind of utilizing the fact that Leona has really short cooldowns and can constantly re-engage very easily. This is also why champions like Alistar are really great with phase rush, because you can kind of combo in, utilize the phase rush, run out, and do it again over and over again. And that pretty much concludes kind of our team fight breakdowns for this champion. Um, do you guys have any other questions or things that you're curious about for Leona? You know, it doesn't have to be about team fights, but just in general, because um, that's pretty much all I got for you guys today. Is the hard part about E Flash the decision if making trading Flash is worth the mechanic? No, the hard part is actually just executing it, <laughs> because you have to press E and like almost instantly flash. That's usually how I would describe the timing, and so you kind of have to almost predetermine that you're gonna do it. You can't do it reactively, but it is really OP because it catch it basically always catches people off guard. Um, because the animation is so fast and it usually guarantees you a kill as long as you QR uh, fast enough like we talked about in the practice tool It's the highest mechanic of pretty much anything in the game as of currently uh, Even pro players don't do it that very often and I would definitely say that when I started learning how to do it I found way more kill angles. It was super helpful for me I was able to engage way more often even in like pro if you actually watch some of my rivals and like pro level play games, I get a lot of engages on people who actually have flash up just because I've learned and mastered the Zenith Blade flash. So it's actually incredibly a powerful tool uh, once you get used to doing it. It changes the landscape of the game a lot because of the fact that you can guarantee engages on people that don't, you know, maybe don't can't quite react fast enough. I've done that before. Yeah, it's really, really good. Uh, e flash should be combable the same way the other combos work, right? Yes. So when you when you e flash, you should cast Q in the air, and then when your auto hits, you should instantly ulti on top of it and lock them out of their ability to spam their flash out. What are the second and third items? Um, <clears throat> so usually if you're frontlining, it's either Knight's Vow or Zeke's, and then the other one. Is Thornmail ever good? Eh, if your teammates are really not building healing reduction, maybe. But the thing is, is if you're playing Leona, you're usually taking Ignite. So Thornmail is kind of useless because you usually should have Ignite like on a consistent basis for your healing reduction if you really need it. <clears throat> I usually recommend if you're going Locket, it's just Knight's Vow and Zeke's. You go either or, and then the other one is third, um, depending on whether or not you need to keep your teammate alive or if you need extra mana and armor for like durability and frontlining. And then um, if I'm going the chem tank build, a lot of times I'll go dead man second because usually if I'm building chem tank, it's under the pretense that, oh, I'm the only engaged or like I need to really get engaged. So movement speed is really great. So I like dead man uh, second. And then you can go force of nature third if you want. And then your, your, um, <clears throat> your fourth item is usually gargoyle stone plate. Uh, what if the enemy team has a lot of AP? Uh, Spear Visage is okay. Force of Nature is okay. Uh, Gargoyle Stoneplate is actually pretty good. <sighs> what about Frozen Heart? Uh, the anti-crit armor. Oh, Randuin's. Um, 
Usually I don't recommend these items because they're just too selfish and expensive. Uh, usually, usually Knight's Vow and Zeke's are good enough that they'll keep you alive if you're team fighting well. In most cases. You could maybe go a Frozen Heart or Randuin's fourth item, but in most cases I'd usually just recommend Gargoyle as the last item because it scales off bonus health, so you've built a lot of bonus health items. Plus it'll give you armor and MR, and it'll make you really, really tanky. Do you have a build Frostfire? No, the item is terrible. It's a waste of gold for sure. You're always better off building Locket if you're not going to go for Chem Tank for Engage. Locket is so, so good. 2,500 gold, um, and it gives you minimum 450 health because you have to, you know, I value the Locket. Plus, the AoE Aura is really powerful for your team. It's super underestimated how much damage you can actually mitigate for your team if you have a good Locket, you know, good Locket shield and the Aura going off. Okie dokie. Then uh, class is adjourned. Hopefully you guys found this helpful. Thank you so much guys for showing up. Really appreciate it a lot. Thanks for asking questions, participating. Uh, it's super helpful. And um, anyway guys, I'll see you guys later. Have a good rest of the weekend. And I'll see you guys. Peace.